My guest today is Chris Judd. Chris, how are you today? I'm doing great, David. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming. I, I can't believe you've never been on my show before. It was an oversight on my part. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to say congratulations on a successful code mesh. I know you were involved in the planning and the execution of that conference, and uh, it's a more of a challenge this year than most year, and you guys pulled it off. Great job. Well, thank you. It was great to be able to be back at a conference with the a lot of friends, so I'm really glad we put it on, and a lot of people came out, a lot of technology was shared, so yeah, it was a great event all the way around. Excellent. Um, what do you do, Chris, for a living, I mean? Yes. <laughs> so I'm the CTO and a partner at Manifest Solutions, which really just means I'm a senior consultant. I still go out on assignments every day, write code, architect solutions, and probably most often get called when those really hard problems come about that People are in a critical situation and they just need some technical advice to get past whatever that situation is. So wear a lot of hats. Uh, I'm also a Java champion. I run the Central Ohio Java Users Group. Hmm. I've spoken at over 100 conferences, co-authored some Java-related books, um, and I've even written a children's book. Oh, excellent. I want to talk about that later on. But uh, today, we were talking uh, before this interview, we were talking about... Um, uh, the skills that, that you find, I mean, you're talking to a lot of customers uh, and they're looking for a certain set of skills among technologists more than others, right? That's, you've, you've yep. sort of got a, almost a laundry list of that. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I do. And so in my role as a CTO, I have the opportunity to see into dozens of companies and see what skills that they're looking for. They send us a lot of uh, job reps that they need filled. So I get to look at those and I also had the opportunity to interview between 75 and 100 people a year myself. So I have a good idea of what that talent pool is out there as well. And like to give you an example, at this moment, we have 150 openings across 14 different companies. So that's kind of the perspective wow. I can give you today. Now, I also realize, too, that you know our organization is based in Columbus, Ohio, even though we have people across the country. Um, so part of my base of knowledge may be a little bit regionally oriented, okay. but I can still give you a good insight into what we're seeing in those requirements. Yeah. Well, I spent a lot of time in Columbus because uh, as you know, uh, Columbus has a really great tech community. You know, the, the, the user groups, the conferences, the, uh, a lot of the code mesh folks come from Columbus. So, um, certainly the tech scene in Columbus is I don't know if it's representative of the East Coast and West Coast, but it certainly is solid, strong. Yeah. And we do have some of those um, requirements are from the East Coast and the West Coast. So hopefully it does include some of what they're seeing as well. Yeah. Uh, what kind of skills are people looking for these days? Yeah. So some of the big trends, probably the biggest trend that we're seeing is the cloud. I mean, the cloud is huge. We're seeing more and more companies, even in a course since the pandemic, really adopting the cloud in a, a very big way. Some of them had initiatives before the pandemic, and now they're really diving into it. And without a doubt, the two biggest are AWS and Azure. Uh, we only have one of our clients in our client base that are using Google Cloud, but most people are diving into AWS, Azure. We do have some clients using OpenStack too, both on-premise and in the cloud, but those two are the largest. And in order to orchestrate a lot of that, we're also seeing a lot of Terraform as well. Uh, Terraform. So this is infrastructure as code uh, sort of thing. Exactly. So that you can start up your virtual machines or other infrastructure in a cloud independent way. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, uh, you say cloud computing. That's, um, that's a big area. Are there specific parts of the cloud that people are more interested in? Uh, we're seeing it adopted all over. So um, we're seeing serverless, we're seeing virtual machines. Um, from a DevOps perspective, we're seeing the adoption of um, build systems, CI, CD in the cloud. Um, we're also seeing the um, uh, CDK in AWS for cloud development kit for also automating infrastructure. Mm. Um, uh, the databases, a lot of the uh, cloud databases, DynamoDB, Cosmos DB are really popular in the cloud. 
and even a lot of Kafka in the cloud as well. So event driven types of oriented cloud types of things. Um, are you are you finding these people? This is uh, with 150 openings is a lot. How are you matching up people to positions? Uh, so we have a recruiting team of I don't know five recruiters that are actively looking at all times. But you know we're not finding enough. We would love to fill <laughs> all those positions. Uh, uh, well, part of this, hopefully, people are watching this and they're they're seeing this and they're saying, you know, I have that skill set, or maybe the, I need to get that skill set. Um, where's uh, you know what's what's the what's the path to becoming a terraform expert for example well i think the first path and what i would recommend for people interested in the cloud is to get certified so both well, all the cloud services have a certification program and that's way a good way to get familiar with it get involved and provide some credentials that um, you know what you're doing and i'm not a huge fan of credentials but those are um, certifications but those particular certifications are carrying a lot of weight right now in the industry so those would be ones that are worth spending your time doing is this something your, your customers are asking for they're not specifically asking for it but i do think that if you have those certifications you are going to be a little bit ahead of your competition when applying for and interviewing for those opportunities and there's a lot of people who are getting them we have several dozen in our company who have AWS certification and another dozen or so who have the Azure certification. So if you don't have those, you're actually probably um, behind the eight ball as far as getting those opportunities. Yeah, I actually wrote a, a blog post years ago because I, uh, I got tired of people saying that certifications were worthless. And what they meant to say, I think, is that certifications are not a replacement for actual experience, which is totally true. But it's not the same thing as saying that they're worthless. They, they can be a difference maker. They can be a tiebreaker. And they can be a way of forcing yourself to learn a new technology. And they can be helpful to a consulting company that wants to remain a, a Microsoft partner, for example. Uh, there, there are reasons why certifications are, are worthwhile. Uh, yeah, that's a perfect way of putting it, because um, I agree with you that it's a difference maker. Uh, I know I've received a couple certifications in the past, one on a, a mobile technology that I never even used. It wasn't even <laughs> my intent to get certified. I went to a training class, and they literally would not let us out of the room until we took the certification exam. And <laughs> they barred yet, the doors. <laughs> they did, and yet I've never <laughs> used the technology. I would not feel comfortable right. actually going to a client and saying, hey, I'm an expert in this because I have a certification. Uh, um, so uh, I, I, I would like to drill them a little bit closer because I, I, I said the cloud is just a, such a broad thing. Is, are, there, are there things that's really sticking out in your mind about um, what, uh, you know, that there's a plurality of demand for a particular service or type of service? I really see it all over the board from data storage to compute power to bid data. Um, we're seeing it, uh, the operation, the dev operation, the DevOps, DevOps right. uh, security. It's all across the board where we're seeing that, that need. It's lift and shifts. Okay. It's taking an application that's already been lifted and shifted and making it more cloud native. Uh, it's serverless. It's really all aspects of the cloud uh, are really in demand right now. Okay, so maybe the, the answer is because there's so much demand um, that uh, somebody needs to either select the, the something they're good at now or pick an area and focus on that. Um, and I hate to drill onto this point, but it, it's I don't think it's reasonable for me, if I'm a, a junior developer, to say I'm going to learn the cloud. <laughs> right. I need to say I'm going to sure. learn databases in the cloud. I'm going to learn DevOps in the cloud. I'm going to learn you know something much more narrowly focused, something that I can actually you know have a fighting chance of becoming proficient at in a reasonable amount of time? Well, if you're looking at how do you get started, then I would suggest a couple of things. One is maybe focus on one set of services, learning how to do that using the web interface, the console, learning how to do that on the command line with the CLI, and also learning how to do that with the SDKs. If you have one service really well done with all of those aspects, then I think adopting the next service becomes rather easy because you know the patterns right. that they're all going to have, and you're going to be able to apply that to whatever the next service is that you need to adopt. Sure. Yeah. If you know one database 
learning the next one is is easy, especially if it's one relational database to another or one document database to another, something like that. Right. Um, are, are you finding that um, you're, you're training people up, that uh, there's uh, enough of a demand that you're going to go that route? Yeah, well, let me talk about some other skills, too, and then we'll talk about training because that's oh, yeah, a big, absolutely, please. important topic, too. Yeah, so cloud is huge. Uh, of course, front end is important, too, so we're seeing a lot of demand for JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, specifically in the frameworks of React and Angular. Uh, those are the big ones in demand. You know, we still see some jQuery, too. So jQuery is still hanging on. It's still out there, but React and Angular are definitely important. Mm -hmm. Some of the table state technologies that we're seeing is everybody needs to know Docker and everyone needs to know Git. So right. uh, if, if you're not familiar with those, if you haven't applied those, go out there and get those now. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing a lot of stuff in event-driven. So we're seeing specifically demand in Kafka and RabbitMQ. Uh, of course, microservices is big. So we've been seeing REST for years. Uh, but really, just recently, we've seen GraphQL come on strong. We're seeing multiple mm. clients really want to uh, start adopting GraphQL in certain ways. Uh, in the Java space, we're seeing tons of Spring Boot, Maven, Gradle, JUnit. Uh, in .NET, we're seeing C Sharp, uh, .NET 5, .NET Core, SQL Server, Entity Framework. Uh, in the DevOps, we're also seeing tools like Jenkins and Azure DevOps. Of course, GitHub, uh, and especially GitHub Actions are really starting to catch on hmm. recently, and we're starting to see demand for that as well. In the Agile space, uh, we're seeing a lot of need for Agile and Jira in particular as far as what tools that they're using in the Agile space. Hmm. And uh, in the big data space, we're seeing a lot of need for Scala and ETL these days. Uh, we do have one client that's looking for mobile. They're looking for uh, iOS developers with experience in Objective-C and Swift. And on the Android side, of course, Java and Kotlin. Uh, but again, it's only one client. That demand seems to be slowing down over the last couple of years. That's interesting. Uh, I see some of the things there are are fairly new. Uh, GraphQL, microservices. These are things that are uh, that are they're hot topics right now. And some of them have been around a while. You know, React and Angular have been on a few years. And uh, it's funny because when they were introduced the JavaScript world was just going crazy. It was, it was frustrating because the new JavaScript frameworks were, were popping up every, every day, it seemed. Uh, yep. But it seems to have stabilized. Yeah, it really has. I, I think we haven't seen, you know, like even Vue.js is out, and you'll see that at conferences, but we're not seeing the demand for that at this point in time. Right. The other I'm thing just, you might I'm be just glad there's about. not a new one every single day that I'm pressured to learn and... <laughs> Uh, only so many hours in a day. <laughs> yep. The other thing you might be surprised about that I didn't mention is we're not seeing a lot of demand for AI and ML. So oh, a lot of what you see in the press and the conferences, but we didn't, of those 150, none of them are in that particular space. And you might also be surprised about Python because you hear Python a ton in the news. But I also think that Python is being really adopted in the data science space. Right. And so... We're not seeing as much of that because we don't do a ton of data science. So we have Excellent. one, only one client right now that's looking for Python. And again, it's a data science type of role. So um, so some of the things that you hear in the news and excitement, sometimes you don't see. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, I don't know how much you think about or talk about the uh, technology hype curve, but it's something I think about with technology all the time. And um, so in that hype curve, you usually have some type of technology that causes a trigger to get people excited, like um, AI and ML right now, I think would be one of those. And people talk about how it's going to solve all the world's problems. It's going to solve world <laughs> hunger. It's going to replace jobs, save money, all these types of things. And at some point in time, we get to this um, peak of inflated expectations. Right. And we start to realize that, you know, not every... This technology isn't going to solve all the problems. And then people start to get disillusioned by it and start to think, well, maybe it doesn't solve any problems. And we get into <laughs> the trough of disillusionment. But once we reach that trough of disillusionment, we start to realize where the technology is applied and can be used quite well. And then we get into the slope of uh, enlightenment. And in that slope is where I think most of the jobs actually come about. 
Mm-hmm. And so you often see hype in the media, at conferences, during the, um, the rise of that technology, during the, that triggering point. And you see things like there's going to be a thousand et need for this job in the next 10 years. And then that doesn't really come about because we start to realize where it's good. And, and I think the time that you really want to start finding those jobs and applying to those jobs is during that slope of enlightenment, because there's going to be more jobs, more companies are adopting it, and there's going to be more opportunities. Uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, The challenge of course is uh, upskilling a little bit before that slope of enlightening. So knowing that it's coming. Right. I don't disagree with during that time you should be learning and that's what conferences are great for so that you see that technology is coming. You find out what you're interested in, find out how to learn it and, uh, and, and what sort resources are available for educating yourself. And then that way, when people are starting to adopt it, you're ready and you're able to jump on board right away. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, talk about training. What's uh, what's your philosophy on training? You know, you've got 150 openings, and you only, and you don't you can't find a, a a person with experience to fill each one of those, but you find some smart people. Yeah. So I mentioned I interview between 75 and 100 people a year. Most of those are early talent right out of college because we have a agility boot camp here at Manifest that we're known for, and we take recent college grads with computer science or equivalent degrees, and we try to fill the gap from what they learned in school to what the workforce is really looking for. Ah. And so we do uh, about four of these a year. And we, one of the differences between us and other boot camps or coding schools is that we're not taking somebody from zero to 20 miles an hour. We're trying to take them from 20 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour in their career. And, we pay them to go through our uh, our boot camp, and mm, so it's okay. a six-week program. We have one focused on Java, and we have one focused on .NET, and the full development stack for all of them. And um, uh, it's been a great program for us for 11 years. We've been doing it about two years longer than uh, what the fad of boot camps have really been. Yeah, I don't think I had heard of the word boot camp in that context 11 years ago. Exactly. So, um, so I believe that training is huge. And so we've been raising our own talent now for 11 years, and we've had a lot of success with that. We've had people that have gone on to work for Microsoft, AWS, NASDAQ, and Google. And, um, and then once they've completed the training program, we place them at our client assignments. And uh, they've been very successful. We just had one client this week that said, uh, one of your graduates only three months in is running circles around some of our senior people. So uh, (laughs) I think we've done a very successful job and we don't just train the early talent. That is a large focus of ours, but we are also are doing uh, a lot of training these days with AWS technologies and taking senior people at our client sites and also progressing them in their career and upskilling them in the AWS technologies. And we've Mm -hmm. even taken that bootcamp model uh, to a large bank where we had a team that was adopting, going from .NET technologies to Java technologies. We took our bootcamp concept, we whittled it down to the specific technologies that they were going to be using and needed, and we did a, a shorter version of it, a two-week version of it, and we did it with, we split their group in half so that they could still continue doing their daily things and making progress, and um, we delivered it twice for them, and they were really happy with the results. They were able to implement the technologies in Java that they needed to. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of upskilling. Uh, that can be our boot camp, consulting. It can be training. And, of course, conferences, because I really enjoy going to conferences and sharing my knowledge and experience there as well. well yeah, me too. And I miss going more frequently. Uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that we haven't, that we should have? Um Well, one other thing um, we could talk about is young people looking for new opportunities or even people currently in the industry that maybe want to shift technologies and things like that. One of the big pieces of advice I like to give them is when they're looking or whether they're going to even evaluate a boot camp if they're really early in their career 
is to go find five or 10 companies they want to look that they'd like to work for, mm -hmm. look at their job requirements and find those cross cutting technologies that you see. Oh. So some of the ones that we mentioned, you know, maybe Angular React, you'll see that across many companies. And then my recommendation would be go learn those technologies mm -hmm. and make them a part of the pet project. And so that you can then go talk about those particular technologies and how you applied them during the interview process. And I think that's going to give you probably the biggest success in, in getting in the door. The other thing I would recommend too is contributing to open source. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's no bigger drop mic moment in an interview than when somebody says, have you ever used technology X? And you can say, not only have I used it, but I've actually contributed to it. Nice. And so again, if you find those cross cutting projects that are open source across those, try to get involved with them. See if you can't make some contributions to it because it, it may open the door and that you may not even expect or, and you're going to learn something throughout the process too. Very cool. I like this idea. I like this idea of looking at, uh, see what's out there because the list you gave me will not be the same list two years from now. These technologies oh, change, the demands change, and this is a way to, to, to keep up on what's, what people are asking for. Um, and it uh, could change based on your region, your country. So good yeah. point. Great point. Um, all right. Now, are you speaking? Um, I know you do a lot of public speaking. Right? What do you have coming up? Uh, so the, I speak at no fluff quite a bit and we have the, uh, Columbus symposium coming up in March and I'll be speaking there about Java web security mm -hmm. and, um, modern, modern unit testing. Well, excellent. I, I won't be at those. <laughs> I won't be traveling for a bit, but uh, I hope to cross paths with you in person again. And it's great to talk to you, to. Chris. Thanks so much. To you too. Sure. I entered the industry for my love of technology, but what I found is an amazing community of friends. And one thing I'll never forget is that IT is a team sport and it's made up of uh, people.